So good evening, everybody. And uh, um, I always thank the people for being at an event, but never like tonight. I feel like saying uh, grazie uh, from the bottom of my heart because uh, we were not really expecting uh, anybody. <laughs> and so uh, I'm very, very impressed that, uh, that you're here. Uh, this is for us, even though it's turning out to be a very intimate moment, it's still very special uh, um, because uh, we have uh, uh, mostly the uh, executive director of uh, uh, the MLA here with us. So this is, for those of you who don't know, the most important association for uh, modern languages and the humanities literature um, uh, in the United States. Um, uh, but the good news is that she's pretty close, so she can come back uh, if we get a chance. And uh, uh, my uh, role tonight, uh, I think uh, you all uh, know me, I'm Teresa Fiore, and I have the pleasure of uh, organizing moments uh, of uh, conversation and exchange like this one quite regularly, uh, thanks uh, primarily to uh, the support of uh, um, the um, um, INSERA Endowment, which uh, was introduced thanks uh, to the generosity of uh, uh, the INSERA family uh, here in New Jersey. Uh, tonight, uh, we are talking about innovation in, uh, um, in language education, uh, and uh, we are um, um, primarily responding to a word that uh, is circulating a lot, and not just uh, in education and in the humanities, uh, but I recently uh, finished uh, um, an article about the crisis uh, in the Mediterranean, the migrant crisis, uh, and uh, one of uh, the points that we raised with other authors uh, is exactly the fact that this word becomes uh, permanent. And instead of addressing it for possible solutions, uh, uh, we all end up in living in this kind of condition. And so one of the purposes of, uh, uh, of this meeting was really to uh, place it upside down and uh, to try to actually offer forms of experimentation and mostly creation of bridges. And that's why the subtitle is linking high school, university, and pre-professional experiences uh, 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 through Italian. Innovation is a, is a key word here. Um, I was at a conference in Georgetown uh, roughly last year, and it was interesting because uh, some people felt that innovation was uh, a little bit too excessive in particular because it was also used uh, at some point in history to change things in the wrong direction uh, when people decided to go to power forcibly. And so we all agreed that the idea of renovating together was actually a, a good approach, meaning that we're not doing away with the past, but we're adapting to an ever-changing present. Um, we want to uh, um, um, discuss the subject of uh, studying language in terms of bringing specific focus uh, to them uh, at a time in which, uh, obviously, uh, we need to link what we do on a campus uh, to the future of our students, uh, uh, to their possibilities uh, in the professional world. So here I said that we had 15 speakers, but uh, we're lucky to have uh, Two or three. Uh, it's still a gift, and we still may see somebody uh, uh, showing up. Um, um, the idea, as you can see from uh, uh, the list that we have distributed, uh, was to bring together people coming from uh, uh, very different uh, aspects of uh, what I call an ecosystem, where we have high school educators, uh, uh, university professors, uh, uh, and uh, um, um, if we're lucky, also people from the uh, organizations uh, at the state level. Um, let me uh, say, as I usually do in these days, uh, that Italian is just a use case. Um, whether you're studying it or not, really all we're talking about could be applied to any language. Of course, every language has its history, its geography, but some of the work that we're doing on, uh, on Italian can be expanded to, uh, uh, to French, uh, to German, to Spanish, and so really the emphasis here is on cross-language possibilities and on uh, interdisciplinarity. And uh, um, with this, I'm going to leave the podium uh, uh, briefly to Dean Friedman, uh, who's been uh, kind enough uh, to join us, uh, and uh, we'll introduce uh, uh, Paula Krebs to you. So this is what happens when I step to a podium. People <laughs> flee. <laughs> All righty. Uh, good afternoon. So it's not a straight introduction. 
I'm just going to a little bit of a uh, Jeremiah to start. Uh, in a recent interview in the Chronicle of Higher Education, to which our guest, Dr. Paula Krebs, is a frequent contributor, Harvard historian and journalist Jill Lepore said, universities have been complicit in letting sources of federal government funding set the intellectual agenda. The size and growth of majors follows the size of budgets, and unsurprisingly so. I don't expect the university to be a pure place, but there are questions that need to be asked. If we have a public culture that suffers for lack of ability to comprehend other human beings, we shouldn't be surprised. The resources of institutions of higher learning have gone to teaching students how to engineer problems rather than speak to people. So not long ago, Paula Krebs was a dean of a college of humanities and social sciences similar in many regards to ours. At Bridgewater State University in Massachusetts, about 25 miles south of Boston, she collaborated with a college's faculty on strategic planning and building ties between campus and community by organizing a regional consortium of employers, public humanities representatives, and higher education leaders to develop strategies for defining and measuring the success of humanities majors post-graduation. Whether that was for assessment purposes or to parry back against the instrumentalist return on investment meme that has dominated the conversation about the value of the humanities and liberal arts in American higher education. Perhaps she can tell us, but impactful activities such as these are less strident remonstrances against the palpable sense of undervaluation we co collectively experience, most recently in the pointed remarks of this university's president to this college's faculty. Then they are tangible and pragmatic efforts to situate our disciplines as the essential core of a satisfying, gratifying, and yes, materially successful life. Some examples of which you'll hear about in a moment. At this time, I'd like to introduce Paula Krebs, Executive Director of the Modern Language Association, which for some of you in the room, you may not know, is the flagship 135-year-old organization serving all of us who study languages and literature. Paul, is, Paul earned a PhD in English from Indiana University and became a professor of English at Wheaton College in Massachusetts. For the last two years, as the MLA's executive director, she has been overseeing all of the programs and business affairs of the many groups and committees responsive to a membership of more than 25,000 scholars and teachers, including serving as the general editor of the association's publications, such as PLMA and Profession, and the many research programs within the MLA. With the big show only just a few weeks away, opening in Chicago, we're thankful for you for taking the time to come to Montclair to join us, to join the conversation about innovations in languages, language and language education with the panelists we were hoping to have <laughs> <laughs> that Professor Fiore has brought together. Please give a warm welcome to Paul Krebs. You know, since we, we have uh, fewer panelists than we thought, um, I'm going to address a couple of things more than I was going to address. Um, I, I want to thank you, first of all, for asking me, and I'm, I'm happy to be here, even given the weather. Um, this is kind of institution is, um, is near and dear to me. Um, I love the students at Bridgewater State. I suspect they are like the students at Montclair State. Um, and I'm a Jersey girl myself, so. Although sometimes Pensacola feels like a different state than up, up this end. So I'm going to give a talk about um, 
language learning and language studies programs and Italian studies um, in particular, but I'm going to intersperse it with some stuff about uh, the value of undergraduate degrees in these fields and how I know um, and, um, and why it's important that you're here. So let me um, start. Interest in language learning in this country is high. Um, that's, that's a really interesting phenomenon. People are wanting to raise multilingual kids. People are downloading apps all the time, right? Duolingo and Babbel and Rosetta Stone sells a lot. People are interested in language. But the way to learn la language can be learned in many different ways. And language can't be learned entirely from an app. We know that. Okay? We know, um, I know because I sat for a year every lunchtime with my Duolingo app to try to learn Spanish. And I have some decent vocabulary now in Spanish, but I could no more speak to somebody in Spanish than I could fly to the moon. Okay? What I need to do is I need to go on a really long vacation to Latin America. Know, and then I'll learn some Spanish. I need immersion. Um, I need to be able to speak to people and I need a cultural context. And that's what higher ed language gives you that Rosetta Stone is not going to give you, or Babel, or Duolingo. Okay? You need the cultural context as well as the, uh, as, you know, the vocabulary, uh, the tenses, the cases. We know that interest in language learning is high. We know the word globalization is everywhere. Everywhere in business schools, everywhere in, in industry, people want you to be uh, f fluent in other cultures, want you to be able to work in a lot of different places, and in order to do that, you have to speak the language. What's ironic is enrollments in languages in institutions of higher education have been down. Um, the MLA's language, we do, um, one of the things that a professional association does is research in its field. So we study language enrollments um, across the country and the trends um, across time. So I can tell you that the language enrollment study we ran in 2013 showed a 6.7% drop in language enrollments. In 2016, a 9.2% drop nationally in language enrollments. This is crazy. Um, in a, in a, a world that gets smaller and smaller, the more technology allows us to communicate with people in different parts of the world, and the more we're able to get to other parts of the world. It doesn't make any sense that enrollments are down. We know interest is up. How do we make sure we get the bums on seats? Okay. How do we make sure language enrollments Meet the needs. Okay. How do we make sure that you are interested enough to come and sit, not in one language class, not in two language classes, but, but take language classes until you can live in that language, until you can think in that language, until you can read and converse and understand another culture as well as a language. How we do it is, is represented in this program in the Italian program here at Montclair State, which I have to tell you is a national model. What they are doing here is what other programs are trying to do and should be trying to do if they're not. So let me talk a little bit about, about those trends. The most successful programs like this one that are increasing enrollments in language study are doing it through curricular innovation. So changing the way they teach their courses and the kinds of courses that they teach, uh, but also um, through outreach. And that's what this program represents today, is outreach, okay? working with the community. College language instruction runs into trouble when it falls into, into a trap that you see at, at, at a lot of institutions where the curriculum is bifurcated. The curriculum is the language instruction courses here, and then the culture and, and literature courses over here. 
And that becomes a divide that's represented in labor. Often the people who teach the language courses um, are not the same people who teach the upper level courses. In a lot of colleges and universities in this country, you know about, about um, maybe you don't, but you should know about the kind of crisis in hiring uh, for PhDs in this country who want to teach at colleges and universities. More and more people who teach at colleges and universities are paid by the course. It's kind of like the uberization of higher education. The people who are paid by the course and don't get benefits and things teach the language courses in a lot of institutions. This is not a Montclair State discussion. This is a national discussion. Are taught, are um, paid by the course and teach sometimes three or four different institutions um, driving back and forth. They don't have benefits. Okay? And then the people who are the tenure track faculty, the people who are the permanent employees of the university, teach the advanced courses, teach the literature courses, and never the twain shall meet. That's not language instruction and this is not literature or culture instruction. That's what a good program blows up, that distinction. Good language programs understand that all language instruction is cultural instruction and all cultural instruction is language instruction. And that students shouldn't have to make a giant mind shift between the, you know, moving from 200 level courses to 300 level courses. It should be smooth and easy and natural. So, again, innovative language programs don't make that kind of bifurcation, don't make that kind of divide. Um, and that includes paying attention to the labor practices on campuses. Maybe it's a different lecture. Um, but all, as I say, all learning, needs, all learning needs to be language learning as well as cultural learning. And language learning, as you know, as language students, doesn't just happen in the classroom. If it does, you're doomed. Um, it has to happen in clubs, in activities, in connections outside of the classroom. And if you're not speaking the language outside of that, you know, three or four hour a week um, that you're in the classroom, you're never gonna learn it. Language learning in some ways is, is kind of the ultimate representation of what a college class needs to be. Um, because in any college class, if you only think about it the hours when you're in the classroom, you're not gonna do very well in it. But in a language class, if you only think about it the hours when you're in the classroom, you're gonna fail. Um, so it's a, it's a really important kind of microcosm for college in general. Um, students, uh, again, students here have access to clubs and cultures from, from their first day of studying Italian. Uh, there's a lot of support for out of the classroom activities. Um, but also, this Italian program um, is an innovative program because it welcomes onto campus students who are interested in studying Italian before they get to college. And that's the kind of outreach you really need, actually in any, um, especially in humanities programs. Um, if you wait for students to come to you, you've waited too long and you won't get the students. Reaching out to the high schools, reaching out to the elementary schools, reaching out to the cultural organizations um, that understand the value of studying language and pulling students in before they ever get here. Because I tell you what, high school, I went to um, give a talk at an, at an undergraduate institution about humanities majors. And, and I talked about all the great jobs, and I'll talk about some of this. Um, I talked about uh, all the value of majoring in the humanities, and the student raised her hand and she said, you know, it's great to find this out now, but that's not what our high school guidance counselors are telling us. They are not telling us to major in humanities fields. And that's the outreach we need to make in studying languages and literatures, which is my field, um, and other humanities fields is to reach out to the high schools and give students permission and give parents permission to give students permission to study what they love. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about what language programs nationally are doing to reverse the trend of declining enrollments and why programs like this one are the future of language learning in the country. Language programs that are seeing steady or increased enrollments are programs that include four different uh, features. Outreach to secondary schools, connections to communities and community groups, career readiness directions, career readiness focus, and tech. Okay. Those are the four things that the most innovative programs are embracing to pull students in. Not only to pull students into the major, but to make sure that when they graduate, they've got things they can point to that help them make that transition to the first job and to careers. First, outreach to pre-college populations, including elementary as well as secondary schools. In this, again, this Italian program excels from invitations to the annual Italian Language and Culture Day, to the programs for high school teachers of Italian, the summer programs for high school, high school students to study Italian. I mean, they're on it, um, and, and, you, and you need to be. In college language departments, we're finding increasingly, again, we can't wait for students to get here to take up a new language. Um, it's much more effective to work on the smooth transition from the high school. We need to court high school language students and show them the ways language and cultural study expands in college, how, how it's different in college from in high school, how the opportunities are different, how the field trips are different, how the study abroad opportunities exist, all the things that are different about college language teaching, language study. We need to put in front of them stories that show how they're going to reach the mastery that will enable them to pursue the literature, the film courses, and eventually the career options that let them use their new language. Part of the way college language study expands on high school is via community connections. You guys are well positioned at Montclair State for those connections, both in Jersey and in New York. Okay. Um, in your case, you, you, you've got the join between the cultural and the business side of Italian life in this area. And you're fully, fully engaging with that. The business made in Italy stuff, fantastic. I read about this stuff and I think, why is everybody not doing this? It makes absolute sense. Um, it enables students to see the value of Italian study for international business as well as culture. Because business doesn't exist separate from culture, and culture doesn't exist separate from business. They are intertwined. Um, and you can't do business if you don't understand culture. And culture needs money, too. Okay. Um, in an age when high schools are channeling students towards STEM, health professions, and business, and you know they are, you know you get that message. Be a, be a STEM major, be a business major. These are great majors if that's what you love. And if that is not what you love, then don't force it. I'm going to tell you some stories. So, I used to be a dean at a school like this. So I got, um, I go to the career stuff, you know, the recruiting day when all the, everybody from all the businesses comes and recruits the students. And I sit and have lunch with the recruiters. And I'm sitting with the guy from CVS. So CVS's headquarters is in that part of the world, in southern New England. It was born in um, um, Rhode Island. Um, and so I'm talking to the regional recruiter for CVS who makes Bridgewater State, where I was, the hub of the recruiting for CVS. And I said, OK, um, so you do a lot of your recruiting. What, what are the jobs you're recruiting for? He said, well. We recruit for a lot of jobs, but in order to get any of those jobs, you have to start on the floor. You have to start managing a local CVS. Doesn't matter if you're going to go into our insurance end, into regional management, into any, any aspect of CVS. And CVS now is CVS Health, right? They're this big healthcare organization. They, they do primary care work. They do community work. They have their own insurance. There are tons of really interesting jobs at CVS. He said, but you got to start on the floor. He said, here's the problem. We get lots of business majors who are happy to start as a floor manager at CVS. 
because they understand that is an entry level job and there are many opportunities ahead of them. He said, but humanities majors, language and literature majors, they, they think that a job at CVS is below them. They think, you know, if they're going to be a managed store man floor manager at a CVS, that, you know, how will they ever face their faculty members? You know, how will they ever reveal this? You know? They don't understand the concept of an entry level job. They are the ones I want. He said, humanities majors are the ones I want. They've got the listening skills, they've got writing skills, they're good communicators, they have uh, analytic skills, they can do research. He said, they're the ones I want. I can't convince them to come and work for me because they can't imagine themselves 10 years down the line in a really rewarding job. All they can think about is the first one. And I blame myself for this as a, as a former English professor because I know I would have been terribly disappointed if one of my majors graduated and took a job at CVS. You know? Because I didn't understand the concept of the entry level job. Because humanities faculty members don't have entry level jobs. Entry level jobs for a humanities faculty member, that's assistant professor. You know? We don't get it because we're in the same industry our whole life long. Okay? So we have to learn how to help you understand what the jobs are out there as well. It's not just on you. Not one more brief story about this. And maybe that wasn't brief. I'll tell this one briefer. Um, so I went to Cisco Systems. Do you know what that is? It's a network engineering company, Cisco Systems. It's a tech company. And the business dean was going, and the science dean was going. And I heard they were going, and I said, I'm going too. Why didn't you guys invite me? They're like, well, this is for business and science majors. I'm, like, I'm going to find out. So I go. And the guy who's in charge of training all the new network engineers is talking about the training that they do and what kinds of people they want for their jobs. And I said, well, what are the things you look for? And he said, well, we look for somebody who can listen to someone and diagnose what a problem is and then try different solutions, keep asking questions until you get to the, to the solution, to you know, the, ultimately the answer. And I said, well, that, you know, that doesn't sound like engineering to me. He said, that is engineering. And I said, well, you keep talking about your entering class of engineers. I said, are they all engineering majors? He said, oh no, there are all kinds of majors. I said, are there humanities majors? He said, what's that? I said, well, you know, English, French, Spanish. I didn't say Italian, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> history. You know, he said, oh, sure, we have them. And I said, when you go to campus, you are recruiting for network engineers, and you are missing out on all the students who would be your best, best network engineers by calling it that. Because no language major is going to apply for an engineering job. No English major is going to apply for an or philosophy major. And yet, you tell me, these are, these are people who get these jobs and do well at them. So what I'm saying to you is the skills you learn in language learning, in literature learning, in cultural analysis are skills in a range of jobs, a million kinds of jobs. Community connections, that's where I was. Um, so we in the humanities have to work harder to show students and their parents I know your parents sometimes oh, you want to major in what? <laughs> okay, um, the value of studying language, literature, and culture, not for the first job. We are not preparing you for that first job as an Italianist, you know, as as a, a social worker. You get a social work degree, you are preparing to be a social worker. We are not doing that in the humanities. We are preparing you for every career you will have for the rest of your professional life. So that the thing you start with when you graduate doesn't have to be the thing you end with when you retire. Those skills you've got, transfer. They are transferable skills. Deciding to major or double major or minor in a language means committing to a career and a life that is outward looking and not narrowly focused. Okay? Many language programs are pushing the value of language study for careers 
But the most successful of them, like Montclair State Italians, resist the urge to take a narrowly utilitarian approach to it. Okay? Resist the urge to say, all right, we are just going to train you for this particular job using your Italian. Okay? Instead, they show students and their parents, and we need to show the high school guidance counselors, that well-rounded global citizens who master language and culture are people who learn on the job. And that's where most career education takes place. Network engineers learn to be network engineers at Cisco Systems. <clears throat> Nobody in, in college teaches you how to do that. And if they did, it'd be out of date by the time you got to Cisco Systems. Italian is not going out of date. I'm telling you. Research skills are not going out of date. Communication skills, not going out of date. Okay. It's not that you can't pair technical skills with language study. Of course you can. Of course you can. Um, the audiovisual translation stuff that you guys are doing is fascinating. This is a career-oriented track within a, within a language major. Very particular, okay? Translating for theaters and opera. It's a specialized skill. It incorporates practical work experience, okay? Into court, and those courses give students a better sense of post-graduation options. Okay. But not narrow. Those aren't your only post-graduation options. They're good things to brag about in your resume. I am all for that. Do internships. Brag about them in your resume. Okay. Um, but learn widely. In, in the, at the MLA, we talk about, and I, and I heard Teresa uh, use the phrase as well, the, the humanities ecosystem, the whole ecosystem of potential jobs that can use your humanities degree. Okay. Um, Winnie Hay of the um, Middlebury Institute for International Studies talks about the ecosystem for language professionals. She refers to translator jobs, editor jobs, but also jobs in global business, sales, conference um, jobs, community interpreting jobs, international project management, the list goes on. You should study what you love. Faculty members should help you understand the value of studying what you love. You should not leave a class, a course, without understanding what you have learned in that course besides the content area, knowledge. So you take a class, if you think all you learned in that class was contemporary Italian cinema, your faculty member has not done a good enough job. That faculty member needs to help you understand the project management skills you learn from doing a long, um, you know, multi-part project, the group interaction skills you learn from doing a group presentation, the research skills you got from the project that you worked on, and you need to be able to name those things that you learned. So you learned the content, but you also learned all kinds of communication skills, maybe data visualization skills, all kinds of things. And you need to be able to talk about them, and we need to help you be able to understand how to talk about the value of what you've learned. I salute every humanities department that's working to make clear to students, to their larger communities, and to the business world, the value of doing what we do in language, literature, and cultural studies. And you're really lucky to have a department like this one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. Uh, let me say that many of these efforts uh, have already been uh, across uh, uh, either languages uh, or departments or even colleges. And so uh, as you continue to emphasize Italian, uh, there's already so much in that word and beyond that word. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's what really matters. Uh, and uh, uh, in order to uh, give you a better sense of what we've been doing in the past a few years, uh, I thought about uh, uh, quickly uh, um, placing ourselves uh, and describing uh, the macro context around some of the things that you have uh, 
uh, described for us uh, um, uh, addressing the students. Uh, thank you for doing that uh, because uh, you've really talked uh, uh, to them in ways that sometimes uh, we don't have a chance to do because we're squeezing this uh, in, a, in a class about maybe Primo Levi uh, or uh, you know uh, uh, a film by Crialese in my case. Uh, and, and really, uh, uh, we need fora, uh, uh, fora like these ones uh, to, uh, uh, to address it with the students. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, actually, uh, later, uh, to better understand how you conceive of uh, the 101 and 102 that you're taking right now. Uh, so, um, uh, Italian uh, is actually one of the uh, 10 largest programs uh, in, uh, uh, in the United States, according to the report that you were uh, just mentioning. We are in this uh, uh, amazing location that you just uh, uh, also referred to, um, which is profoundly Italian historically. Uh, but because of the uh, continuous diaspora out of Italy, there's actually a very vibrant uh, Italian community uh, of recent uh, uh, arrival as well. But one thing I want to mention uh, that we're also in a very Hispanic area. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, we were designated as a Hispanic serving institution in 2017. Uh, and this is uh, very meaningful to us, in particular, in the ways in which uh, we're starting conceiving uh, of how languages uh, uh, can be taught uh, at the same time. I'm thinking of something that they're doing at Long Beach State, uh, where Romance languages are actually taught at the same time, thanks uh, to a new uh, method that is coming out of uh, Roma 3 within uh, the European uh, framework for, uh, for languages, um, um, due to the similarities. Uh, so what you were referring to in terms of how much students uh, can learn in a quick way, they can actually learn in a quick way in many languages at the same time time and that can be explored and exploited and leveraged in very effective ways. Now because not everything can be done and there are a lot of uh, beautiful models out there for us to follow, we've started with two uh, uh, focused areas. Uh, one is, uh, uh, is business uh, and uh, we'll say more later with uh, reference to internships and to the new combined major that we're launching in fall 2019. And the other one is, uh, is translation. Uh, it's one that is uh, uh, still uh, taking shape, but uh, we've already done uh, a lot. Now, how do we approach the changes that you were describing? We think that you don't just change the curriculum, even though that's a, a fundamental part of what you do in reforming a, a field. Uh, but you have to have different components. You're changing the courses, uh, you're thinking about outreach, uh, you have uh, special projects in classes, uh, you develop internships, uh, you even have moments like these ones, uh, in part because uh, this is a uh, 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 part of my job here, but I'm a profound believer of uh, the epiphanies that can take place uh, at a cultural event uh, when you listen to somebody whose path uh, can become a model, right? Uh, and so uh, all of these have been uh, uh, shaped uh, in the past uh, two or three years uh, really to place emphasis on translation and in particular audiovisual translation and then uh, it made in Italy. Uh, today we have time to talk about internships and the summer course uh, for students. And we are lucky that we can count also on an endowment which was designed to support these activities. But I really want to make a point that money is not everything. That ideas can go really far. And mostly money can also be used to the benefit of more than one area. Because we can all actually uh, enrich that experience. And so um, uh, let's start with uh, uh, this high school program that uh, uh, was launched uh, two years ago. We are already thinking about the third edition. And uh, uh, it's my great, great pleasure uh, to uh, ask uh, Patty Grunter to come to the podium. And I say this because uh, uh, by meeting uh, uh, Patty, she will tell you how it all started. I have actually put one place uh, in the high school system. And this, uh, to go back uh, to uh, Paula's comments, uh, 
is a, a, a new adventure because as professors, uh, uh, we rarely are part of that uh, part, uh, that system, especially for somebody like me who actually went to school in another country. And uh, I am learning tremendously and I'm seeing the bridge that Paula was describing uh, very, very clearly and understanding that it can be incredibly fruitful uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, I did not mention that the bios of our speakers are in the sheet that we have uh, uh, distributed and uh, um, really you need just a couple given the reshaping of the program. <laughs> thank you, Teresa. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to thank uh, Teresa Fiore for organizing this, Dean Friedman for um, the opening remarks, and I really enjoyed your, your talk, Paula, so much. Um, a couple of things that just come to mind before I even talk about the summer course that relate to what she said. I was talking to my son. My son is a 26-year-old business management consultant. And uh, so he's been in his job for two years. And I was talking to him about how I'm working really hard in my Italian classes to get kids to read a big piece of text and learn how to identify the main points and write a succinct summary. And um, I was saying, you know, they, they don't seem to have a lot of skills in this area, but we're working on it, we're getting some place. He said, Mom, that's what I do every day. He said, you need to tell your students, this is gonna help you, not even necessarily at college, in your jobs, because this is what I have to do. I take a mass of information, I figure out what's the most important thing, and I work it up into a presentation that has to be given in five minutes, and I have to go right to the points and say how they're going to be applied to whatever that person's job is. So that made me feel really good. And I could tell my students, I'm not just doing this to like torture you. Like there's a real value to this. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the summer course. Today's so this is done through here that I'm gonna do, or just through here, okay. Um, the arrow, here, thank you. Okay, we can probably come to here. So this course began because in my high school there's no AP course. And I was the only language in my school that didn't have AP. Why? Because we were the only language that didn't have a course at the middle school. There was no Italian at the middle school. And I was told when I was hired, you can't do AP. And when someone says to me, you can't, it's like a challenge. It's like a red flag in front of a bull. I thought, really? That doesn't seem fair. And uh, I, I worked on this problem for years, and I came up with this thought, what if we could take kids and do a summer course that's really intensive. And I may not have enough kids in my school, but what if I formed a consortium of schools around me in northern New Jersey where Italian is studied in many schools? And in this way, I could get these kids to have a head start. It wouldn't be for every kid, but it would be selected kids who were really motivated, wanted to study in the summer, and could actually skip Italian four and go right into AP. And I sent out letters of interest, and one of those letters went to Teresa Fiore just because I'd been to an Insera event. We talk about the synergy of community outreach. I came, I live in Montclair, I heard about a professor giving Italian cultural events and I came and I met her. And she got in touch with me and said, I wanna have outreach to high schools. And I said, I'd love to connect to college. It was like, boom, and it all came together. And this is how we started to work together with another professor who can't be here this evening, Marisa Turbiano, and the three of us really slaved over this because it's not easy to reinvent the wheel because there is no other course like this in the United States. There's no other Italian summer course where kids go on campus and get college credit that as, as we do with our course. Um, I think we said we want to see the video, right? So it's not touch screen. I'm so used to touch screen. This is my problem. I go around hitting people's computers. For those of you who may have seen this we apologize, but it's worth seeing. Okay, <laughs> uh, the objectives of the course are not to substitute AP, but really to prepare these kids to face AP their senior year with a greater level of confidence and a toolbox of skills that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Motivating students to keep taking Italian uh, in college and to reach a high enough level where they're really fluent and they can actually use the language in their lives and in their careers. Italia per mangiare. Italia per mangiare. Niente altro. 
they get the experience of three full weeks on campus uh, with that college experience and as well they're, um, they're able to get a full immersion experience. We do three hours in the morning, uh, a lot of grammar based stuff, but also lots and lots of speaking and culture. We have lunch together, we have Italian guests, Italian speaking guests at lunch, uh, and it's a wonderful experience for the kids. We've had lots of really fun trips. We've been to Italy and New York. The kids have learned how to make pizza in an authentic Italian pizzeria with an Italian pizza pizzaiolo who taught them. Uh, we have visited the Metropolitan and had an art historian, Italian speaking, take us through the Renaissance art collection in the Met. While I was like looking for something to do during the summer, I saw this course as an option and I've never heard of anything like it's like it and I wanted to prepare for the school year. So I said, why don't I do this course? I'll be able to have more fluency within the language. Everything I learned here is something new that I can take with me to class. The field trip I probably enjoyed the most was going to the Met. I really love museums and it was very interesting for, for me to learn about um, these paintings that I've seen before because I visit the Met very often but explained to me in a different light of a different culture. I had the opportunity to participate in this wonderful program with the girls of the lower levels from different schools e da diversi uh, background culturali. Uh, abbiamo avuto uno studente um, che è arrivato in America dalla Repubblica Dominicana uh, nel 2007, uh, una studentessa che è originaria uh, uh, dell'Africa. Abbiamo potuto insegnare italiano a questi ragazzi, è stata un'esperienza fantastica. Oltre alla grammatica abbiamo um, usato anche molta musica e tecnologia uh, per tenerli attivi e allegri e coinvolti per tre ore uh, e questi ragazzi sono stati veramente eccezionali. The success of this course is due also to parents and caregivers' belief in the importance of world languages as part of the formation of today's global citizens. Students benefit academically for a number of reasons. It's a full immersion course with rigorous standards, its content covers language, culture, and conversation, and there's also the ever-important social aspect. Uh, ho deciso questo corso perché mi piace molto l'italiano e volevo um, sempre um, studiarlo dopo nella mia vita e voglio studiare relazioni internazionali. <laughs> voglio uh, prendere l'esame AP per uh, avanzare la mia uh, conscienza italiana. Ho scelto di seguire questo corso perché io in settembre andrò a questa università. Voglio studiare italiano uh, nell'università, penso che forse faccio un minor in italiano e poi voglio cercare di avere la mia cittadinanza all'Italia perché voglio vivere, vivere in Italia. Questo progetto è un esempio ideale di sinergia tra scuola e università che coinvolge enti e figure tra le più diverse e che si completano a vicenda. Un'università, un Oakland State University, un consorzio di licei, un fondo universitario come Vinserra, enti legati al governo italiano come lo IACE e benefattori privati. Di fondo due insegnanti delle scuole e due docenti universitarie che per un anno lavorano insieme per sostenere un progetto con benefici tanto a breve quanto a lungo termine. Siamo convinte che le sinergie e in particolare quelle aperte alla sperimentazione siano una delle risposte più convincenti per permettere alla lingua e cultura italiana di continuare ad avere un ruolo importante nella complessa società di oggi. Sosteneteci e dateci idee. Um, we, time wise, I'm just going to kind of um, really fly through these slides. So, 
maybe I, I might even just skip some of them. Um, let's just say this, that what um, Paula Krebs was talking about, this idea of culture and language being intertwined and inseparable, that's one of the bases of, these, of this course, is the idea that we're not just going to stay in the classroom, we are in the metropolitan New York area, we're gonna go out and we're gonna reach out to sites that are particularly Italian, and um, we're fortunate to be in this area. So, for example, um, you know, we talked about the Met, okay, but we also went to, this past summer, to an, a modern art museum. And so we're getting the whole range of Italian culture, not just perhaps the greatest hits kind of thing. We went to see po uh, Arte Povera, which is a, a style of art from the 60s. Uh, it was an amazing field trip. Um, we, this past summer, we went to Scavolini, who designed kitchens. They're one of the major uh, kitchen and bathroom designers in the world. And it was, it was amazing how our kids just really loved seeing a, an Italian who welcomed us into their showroom in Soho and explained to them how the materials are chosen, how he's marketing in the world. And it was a, a, an eye-opening experience for many of our kids who didn't have a lot of knowledge in this area. Um, we also um, can't leave out food. How do you study Italian culture without food? Speaking of things that are intertwined. So um, Italy is an amazing, an amazing place. Um, these are not my hands, but I got to make this pasta, and I was really impressed with how great they are at teaching us. Italy is a cultural experiment. It is not just food. And I suggest that you all go there because it's really an amazing experience. Um, we have these working lunches. You didn't see it so much in the video, but we eat lunch together and we bring in local experts, college professors, and the kids learn about not only the program at Montclair State, but all of the kinds of opportunities that there are for them at this university and out in the world. Um, every, everything's done in Italian and we've just found these amazingly generous people who are coming on campus to talk to our kids and enjoying it themselves. Um, one of the things that's special is the fact that we have input from college professors and from high school teachers. And this divide has not been helpful to anybody. If I don't know what kids are doing at college, how do I prepare them in high school? If you don't know what we're doing at high school, how do you know how to approach these kids and how do you know what their knowledge base is and their experience is? So this is so exciting because this opens up better communication and better teaching at both levels because we're more connected to each other. Um, again, all of the community events we mentioned that uh, Professor Fiore arranges, um, also the outreach that we've been able to make to outside organizations. So we have any number of entities, uh, including the Italian American Council on Education, uh, who support us, who are giving us grants. And the grants are important because we are trying to grow our consortium of, of schools who associate with us. And some of these schools are in areas where you have a, a high number of low-income kids. And right from the beginning, I told Teresa, and she agreed with me, that this has to be open to anybody who is passionate about Italian and who is motivated. So we've been offering scholarships. The first year, I believe, it was 30% of our students. Last year, it was 50% of our students are there on scholarship. And that is because we've had this incredible support. The consulate in New York has supported us. All different entities have. Um, if we talk about what we're focusing on is that we are not ignoring grammar, but we're also not studying it by itself. It's integrated into the cultural activities that we do and the conversations that we have. This is considered a pre-AP course. So we are working really, really hard at getting kids prepared so that when they go into that AP classroom, they are comfortable. And we're breaking the speaking barrier we call it, because that's the last one that you break down that wall. And when you're doing four and a half hours a day of Italian, it has a big effect, because the kids finally just break through, and once they're through, it's really exciting. You get to, you know, you're on the road to fluency. Um, we can say that, I, I actually think that we've pretty much talked about this. The only thing I would like to say is the exceptional idea of getting the three credits. Um, we're looking into where they're being accepted. I just got an email two weeks ago from one of our students who's at the University of Maryland, and they accepted her three credits from that summer course. So they're spendable here at, at Monkler State for sure, but moving forward, they're going to be used, you know, even at other universities. 
let's talk about what this is doing for, for Montclair State. We can say to 15. So three of our students from the first year are enrolled at Montclair State. Uh, if you look at the 29, I assume that's sort of the majors that you have in the department, right? When it says 29 on this slide? It says from 2017 class of 29. I, th I think that means no. I no. Meant, uh, of the, uh, sorry, it should have been twenty students. Oh, it's just a, it's just a typo. Yes. Okay. So what we're saying is that um, ten percent of the of the class went to Montclair State. Um, and Christina, I hope you're going to have time to come up here and talk because uh, you saw her in the video. And what you find is that sometimes their plans change, and sometimes um, people who thought they'd minor are majoring, etc. Again, today's had talked a little bit about trying to reach out to Spanish-speaking students. Um, it's, we need to create more incentives, and um, we're working on this. So let's just you know, finish up talking about what our future goals and challenges are. Um, we spend a lot of time finding our students, and they're out there, and sometimes we don't know how to reach them. So unfortunately, most of the people here are students, and I was hoping to direct my comments to Italian teachers. We need their collaboration to make this really take off. Because we know that the course is quality, and we know what it does for students. We're just not sure how to reach all of them in their high schools and let them know about the opportunity. Uh, we also need teachers involved in the follow-up process. We need to collect data. We just started, and so it's early, but we do want to have the data to show you know, what we're able to do. Um, we're looking at possibly having some kind of residential option. A lot of people from Connecticut or New Jersey, South Jersey are saying, I want to come, I can't commute. So that's hopefully a next step, a possibility. And then going back to what Paul was saying about all languages, um, the idea would be that this could serve as a model. And there would be courses like this in French and in Spanish and in German and in Chinese. And the need is there. The kids in the high school are interested. So it's a case of you know working together and bringing the right people together in the, in the room to have this conversation. Anyway, I hope that you got a feel for this, um, and if you have a flyer, you can always get in touch with us. Be happy to answer any specific questions that anyone has. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we also have a survey online because uh, we'd like to have uh, uh, early on a sense of uh, uh, how many students uh, are interested so that we can, uh, uh, we can plan accordingly. Um, uh, at this point, uh, we were supposed to have uh, a, a high school teacher to have the perspective of uh, uh, the teacher who gets the students uh, back into the class. Patty has had that experience. Uh, uh, she was able to offer AP after the first year, and uh, uh, many of the students actually got uh, threes, fours, and fives. And as you know, there's a, a transferability also of all of these uh, because we do actually, in our department, uh, recognize uh, uh, the scores uh, and students uh, can go into intermediate or advanced classes. Uh, so this is working at so many different levels. Uh, and there was a slide that said uh, very openly, and I really want to remark on this, uh, the pre-AP class is not in competition with an AP class. It actually fosters an AP culture. It helps those AP classes have enough students to run. And it also helps the university system in the long run because the students acquire college credits. The students uh, are prepared uh, with the AP to actually be part of uh, uh, the, the, the backbone right, of a program, uh, that is to say minors uh, and majors. So I'm going to uh, uh, skip uh, uh, these, uh, these, these two. Uh, uh, we also were supposed to have uh, uh, the uh, president of uh, Yace from uh, New York. Um, uh, his main point was that AP in Italian is only growing. And so that's another uh, piece of the puzzle, which is very important for us, because obviously the students need to be told that with AP, uh, they can actually uh, join us organically. But we know that AP sometimes works more for acceptance into a college, rather than to define what we are big advocates of, that is to say, multiple paths at the same time through combined majors uh, or uh, through uh, minors and majors, uh, hopefully through double majors. And I have something to say uh, about this. Again, I'm, I'm skipping a, a, a lot of uh, uh, things here. Before moving to business, though, 
uh, and this is actually related to business too. I'd like uh, to have uh, uh, Cristina Latino here uh, to uh, say just a few lines about her experience uh, in uh, the summer course and what it did for her. Uh, Cristina. Um, uh, let me say that Cristina actually joined the course, uh, you can come up to the podium, um, uh, as a, not necessarily as a high school student, but as a, a, a student in transition. She had already finished high school and she intended to come uh, uh, and she decided to take that course as well. So it has turned into a course that is serving different populations beyond our initial plan. Cristina. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Christina Latino and I am a sophomore Italian and business major here at Montclair State with a double major in fashion studies. In April of 2017, upon making my decision, my decision as to which university I would attend in the up upcoming few months, I made the choice to enroll as an undeclared incoming freshman so that I could broaden my options and experience a variety of different selections that could lead me to a potential career path. When I decided to take Italian 140, which is part of the Italian Summer Immersion Program here at Montclair State, it was an opportunity to gain three college credits in three weeks at a fraction of the normal cost. I was not expecting to finish the course with a definite decision to declare my choice to study in the combined Italian and business major. Making the choice to pursue this degree and career path was quite easy it was quite an easy decision. For the experiences that this course provided me with, especially the field trip to Italy and New York, opened my eyes to the global praise of the Made in Italy brand and allowed me to envision myself as a future businesswoman with a mission to continue to represent the Italian culture and products internationally. Now, as I complete my third semester here at MSU, I can wholeheartedly say that combining a language with a career set in the corporate world has provided me with endless opportunities in to not only utilize the language in everyday life, but to sharpen my communication and leadership skills so that I may be fully prepared in the future to pitch ideas and negotiate deals which would allow Italian-made products to thrive inter internationally. Thank you and grazie. maybe a minor, and here she is, a double major. <laughs> and she's a phenomenal coach and Sarah student intern for the tremendous service. <laughs> One thing that uh, Cristina uh, uh, did not mention, which I think is particularly important, uh, is uh, that at Italy, uh, she actually listened uh, to a student of ours who graduated a few years ago, who's working there full time. <laughs> and uh, that moment uh, really made the connection. She realized that, that she could study Italian and maybe end up there. And so uh, we hadn't really planned things this way, but it's interesting that these are the connections that are being developed. Now, a few words about language and business uh, and culture and the ways in which they have developed. The Dean can also uh, jump in to say a little bit more since uh, this is a project that has involved many, many people. It doesn't belong to one person only, as you can imagine. It's uh, uh, too, uh, too big to be something like this. Uh, we were reminiscing the other day on how it all started with uh, a meeting that we had in this very uh, building with uh, uh, representatives of Italian companies. We sat around the table and we learned exactly what Paula was saying before. They were saying that they're not interested sometimes in uh, business majors. They want people who can be part of uh, groups uh, where ideas are discussed and actually different perspectives uh, are uh, what they seek constantly. And uh, the conversation was very eye-opening. We started considering this process of reverse engineering by which uh, not only the same way Patty was saying uh, you need to know what they're going to do in college, we need to know what they're going to do when they work so that they, we can change uh, curriculum, we can change content uh, and, and adapt it. 
Uh, over time, we've been in touch uh, with some of them. In the process, uh, we have rethought our courses. Uh, we have come up uh, with uh, uh, Made in Italy projects, uh, thanks uh, to the support of the INSERA Endowment. Uh, students have met major leaders uh, in Made in Italy here in, uh, uh, in New York. Uh, they've been inspired by them. Uh, we have developed uh, internships, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But then, of course, uh, for us was the coronation, and that is to say, the language, business, and culture combined major, uh, which uh, uh, involves French, uh, German, and Spanish, and uh, has brought uh, two colleges together uh, on campus. So we're going to launch it in fall 2019. And I think we really need to uh, applaud the work of the deans, and uh, we need to, uh, um, uh, to recognize that it's been a, a, a combined effort. Um, and uh, um, I don't know if you have anything to say specifically. Rob, about this uh, now. Okay. Uh, so, with these uh, um, uh, combined major students, uh, will. Uh, have both disciplines uh, from the very beginning. Uh, we'll concentrate on, uh, um, uh, on, on two areas, uh, but in a combined way for the total of 42 credits. Uh, so it's uh, more than a, what a language would be and less uh, uh, than, a, than a business major, technically, but pretty close to it. Um, as uh, uh, we move on, then, uh, I would like uh, to share with you what we've done uh, with the internships. Um, uh, that day, uh, at the table, uh, we developed a, a relationship with uh, Choose New Jersey. Again, we were supposed to have uh, the representative here at the table. Uh, that relationship uh, was also developed uh, thanks uh, to uh, our work with the Feliciano Center for Entrepreneurship in this very building, uh, uh, Dennis Bone uh, in particular. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, I was inspired to launch this critical Made in Italy series also as part of the events because uh, for me it was very important that students wouldn't just uh, uh, think in terms of selling products but we think about what it means to have an idea around a product, the culture that sustains it, the different declensions that that product acquires depending on where it circulates, and the principles of beauty, elegance, well-being, anything that goes with a whole set of values and principles that a culture attaches even to a small object. Think design for a moment, and that becomes very obvious to you. Uh, so uh, we started talking, uh, including uh, with the Italian trade agency, uh, represented that day by the director Maurizio Forte, and we came up uh, with a really interesting internship that actually happens both at the Italian trade agency, uh, the uh, commercial branch of the Italian consulate in New York uh, on Park Avenue, uh, and then the second part is uh, at Choose New Jersey, which is based in Princeton. It was very important for us uh, that a student we choose uh, is able to look at both sides of the metropolitan area, right? Uh, and really become familiar with the fact that this is a profoundly Italian business area. Uh, there are many visible stores in New York, especially, let's say, on Fifth Avenue or Madison Avenue, but uh, there's a whole huge uh, uh, ecosystem of headquarters and even production houses, right, uh, where uh, uh, products come, are distributed, uh, and uh, this was a, a unique occasion for us uh, to understand that there's a really big chunk of Italian economy just a few miles away from us. And our intention is to continue to develop this network and to enrich it. Uh, the first year, uh, Emma Rush uh, worked uh, in particular on uh, socially conscious companies uh, in the field of, uh, of business at the Italian Trade Agency. She's a double major in uh, uh, um, international justice and Italian. Note how all these students are double majors. There isn't a culture of double majoring, sometimes not even majoring and minoring, because students we've discovered think that it's too much to handle, and it is not. It's actually a question of planning, of using your AP credits, of using the credits you get in a summer course, and then use your gen ed intelligently. If you do this, you can actually easily be with you know, your feet in two different places that end up in being one, and that one is you, the person actually going around with that type of unique knowledge. Uh, the second year, Talia Antonacci was supposed to be here, uh, uh, instead focused uh, on uh, wine business and learned a lot about grape varieties and distribution of, uh, of wine. 
Uh, the internship at Choose New Jersey the first year ended up in having an international component, which is uh, really important for us. Emma ended up in planning a business trip to uh, uh, Milan, Verona, uh, Bologna, uh, and Firenze. Uh, for 10 days, she was uh, with uh, the team from Choose New Jersey, and she met dignitaries uh, and uh, representatives uh, of uh, companies in Italy that are interested uh, in coming to uh, New Jersey, because Choose New Jersey is actually designed to do this, uh, to attract business uh, to the state. Uh, I don't think I need to explain to you uh, what that was for her. Can you imagine being with a team who's working, not educating a student, working? And she was part of that, and she was very important thanks to her language skills, as you can imagine. And let me finish quickly before we open up to questions with the other internship we've been able to develop. And this is again thanks to the generosity of Mr. and Sarah since we can pay the students. We know that students would rather be busy during the summer with a job that they need in order to pay tuition. And uh, we help them in that respect, uh, giving them a possibility to have a pre-professional experience, uh, but without uh, losing that necessary financial income. Um, uh, in Italian translation, we've also done a lot of uh, curriculum revision in view of uh, hopefully the formalization of something that we can specifically call uh, translation uh, along the same lines of business. Uh, we have received grants, uh, we have had uh, public programs, but really this internship uh, has become uh, something very, very important to us to give meaning to this organic approach. If you want to know more about what we've been doing, for many, many years, so since 2011, really in translation, uh, uh, please visit our page, which is called the Italian Translation Project. This is where our students go when they go to Italy to do uh, surtitling of operas, uh, perform performances, uh, 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 theater plays. Uh, they are at the Arena di Verona. Uh, they are at major theaters uh, uh, all around, uh, and uh, um, they uh, have also done this work for our uh, own theater, uh, the Casser, which uh, allowed us uh, to actually uh, take the loop all the way around. First, they surtitled for the Piccolo Teatro di Milano, for a fantastic play that eventually Jed Wheeler at the Casser decided to bring to uh, our campus, and this is where the surtitle ended up uh, in being uh, useful both in Italy and uh, in the United States. Our point of pride is certainly what students uh, do in Macerata as part of the internship. Uh, this is the theater where one of our students literally lives for eight weeks. It's a very intensive experience because you have to be with the, the, the groups of singers and musicians rehearsing and changing things. So I'm sorry that Oscar is not here to give a, a, his direct uh, story about this, but it is a life-changing experience. And I want to emphasize two things. It's not just surtitling, providing uh, another language to these uh, uh, beautiful performative moments. That too, obviously. But what they're doing at Macerata uh, is very important because uh, through audio descriptions and surtitles, uh, they're really creating a program of accessibility for people who are visually uh, impaired or hearing impaired uh, to be able to access uh, these performances. So language is where we started. And we ended up in realizing that we were doing what we would call community service, but I'm not really sure we want to use just this term. Uh, we're really being inclusive in the best sense of the word. And this uh, we need to say thank you to Macerata for because uh, they're fully equipped to expose our students uh, to, uh, uh, to that experience. Um, and uh, um, with this, uh, maybe we can open up to some questions. Uh, we, or at least Paula doesn't have a, a lot of time, uh, uh, but uh, if you have a question for her, actually, uh, please do so now uh, um, so that we use our time uh, the best way. You can always email me. <laughs> I, I would, can I say that? Um, I, I was just wondering if you've ever heard about this study that they did at Google. They, they did a study at Google where they sent out to their upper management a questionnaire, personnel department, 
and they said, what, what are you looking for? What do you need in your departments? And they were sure they'd have to do a lot of tech stuff. And they got back, literally every one of their manage, upper managers said, please don't send me any more tech people. That's all I get is tech people. I need people with, and they now have a new term for this called soft skills, which is, you don't like it, huh? <laughs> which is this idea of, I would call communication skills. And, and it's, you know, they needed people who could speak to other people and understand them and listen to them, all the things that you were saying. Have you, have you seen that, that study or anything? I haven't looked at the study itself. I haven't looked at the news reports about mm -hmm. it. And there, there's tons of evidence about that. The Association of American Colleges and Universities does an employer survey every five years. They say the same thing. It's a, um, and if you read the tech magazines and the business magazines, you see these articles over and over again. Uh, there's tons of evidence for that out here. Um, and I don't, I, 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 and I think we need to get the message to parents and guidance counselors. Yes, uh, uh, Elizabeth Emery from uh, the French program. You know, we've just started a, a K-16 to uh, committee uh, at the MLA to, to do that outreach to high schools that we haven't traditionally done. For example, we publish a lot of um, volumes, uh, approaches to teaching, you know, Boccaccio or wh whatever. Um, but we have never specifically targeted um, high school writer, uh, high school instructors to write for those so that, because, um, Articles about teaching that are all aimed at college uh, level teaching aren't necessarily transferable uh, to secondary education. And now, so we have now started to do that, to uh, the volumes on approaches to teaching, we started to do outreach to high school teachers as well so that we can make sure that we can hit both, both areas. Uh, we don't have a lot of members who are high school teachers. We have traditionally been, we're a learned society, right? We're, we're traditionally been research oriented. But we're moving more and more into that focus because, again, if you want to bolster enrollments in the humanities, that's the way to do it, is to do the outreach to, to high schools as well. Uh, we, we always invite high school uh, teachers to attend the convention for free uh, in the cities that we are. It's very rare that, that high school instructors actually come to the convention. They don't see it as welcoming enough. We're working on that. I'm going to go catch a plane in Houston. Okay. <laughs> There. Is there any other question? Uh -huh. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I have a question about you. So um, I was wondering why, and it's also I think the question you have, why you don't get more uh, high school instructors, teachers interested in this program. You seem to say that you are interested in getting more said at a certain point, we want to emphasize this is not competition. And this is precisely because perhaps in the beginning, the, the course is unique, and, they, and people didn't know what it was. And we felt like we were communicating very clearly that this would be such a help to a, an AP teacher because it would boost your, your, your student score. And yet, there were, not everybody, but there were some teachers who kind of had a hands up, kind of, I don't know about this. Um, and, and hopefully we're getting through to them and they're hearing their colleagues who say, wow, my kids came back and those are the leaders in my classroom now because those kids came back with the confidence in class to speak and it set an example for other people. So you're not incorrect in surmising that this could have been an issue. We're working on overcoming it. Uh, I, I just have a suggestion. Okay. I'm the director of a very small program in the Chicago area. We have, we have a, 
uh, one day eventually in French. And in fact, we, we decided years ago to uh, not only have high school students participating in our uh, immersion day, but also teachers. So basically, we invite up to 10 teachers out of you know, 125 participants. And that way, every year, uh, we get uh, teachers who tell their colleagues that they really like it and, and so on. So what do you do once you get teachers who are interested in your program? Um, so you're saying at the university, you offer this full immersion day? Uh, actually, we, we use, we are hosted by the, by the university, uh, but we, we, I was really surprised when I, when I looked at the video, when I watched the video a few days ago uh, from home, because we, we do things very similar to you. Um, Great minds think alike, I guess. Yes, it's, it's very alike, yes. Uh, but in fact, it's not organized by the university, it's sponsored by the AATF, but it started as a joint program 20 years ago. Uh, it was hosted and it uh, mixed college students and high school students, and mm -hmm. it took place uh, actually in, we are in Chicago, but it took place in Wisconsin for two days. That was a great place. And so we were able to have those kinds of students, but most of the teachers are high school teachers. They are not. Yeah, Thank you for that contribution. It's a really interesting idea. Thank you. I would like to honor the presence of uh, Eric Perkins, uh, who actually drove for probably more than two hours, uh, and within one mile maybe, uh, <laughs> um, to represent Choose New Jersey. And uh, uh, he has uh, uh, to say a few words. I've already talked about Choose New Jersey a little bit, but feel free to uh, add a few things maybe in terms of what they would like to do in the future, uh, which I think is very important. But Eric has also a very interesting story. As you can see in the bios, uh, he's a lawyer, uh, but he also works uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Choose New Jersey, and he'll tell you himself uh, in what capacity. So, uh, good evening. Uh, you're better off inside than outside, or even trying to go wherever you want to go. It's, <laughs> it's pretty awful out there. Um, so, uh, as uh, Professor Fury uh, just indicated, uh, Choose New Jersey uh, is a uh, not-for-profit, uh, privately funded entity, and uh, my law firm, along with other uh, companies, Fortune 500 companies in New Jersey, uh, fund this. And the idea is, is to try to attract business to New Jersey. And so, uh, Choose New Jersey becomes sort of like a business manager. Uh, they help uh, companies that come to New Jersey, uh, who are in New Jersey, uh, find uh, sites, personnel, and a variety of things. And so it's all about selling the state and, and uh, making it accessible to uh, people who are outside the state. It involves coordinating also uh, state agencies where uh, different businesses might be interested in, in getting the systems. So uh, they have uh, working relationships with uh, the EDA, the Economic Development Authority, as well as other government agencies. Uh, state government agencies to facilitate that. So it's, it's intended to, to attract business. And so uh, as a result, uh, Choose New Jersey is tied very, uh, is tied very closely to uh, the university. We have approximately 60 universities here in the state of New Jersey. Uh, we have a highly educated uh, uh, populace. And as a result, uh, there are a lot of opportunities. And that's why you see, for instance, a lot of life sciences that have established themselves here, as well as other uh, companies. Um, so, Truth in Jersey had an intern uh, this past year, uh, and uh, because of the connections that we were able to develop with Italy, uh, they went uh, there and they had a series of meetings with Italian companies. And as a result, uh, this intern was able to go with Truth in Jersey. Truth in Jersey had this intern there. The intern who was with the Italian department was able to uh, participate in these meetings and in fact facilitated the meetings because of her ability with Italian was able to act, in essence, as a translator, interpreter, uh, between the Italian companies and Choose New Jersey. Uh, I dare say that the, the staff at Choose New Jersey doesn't speak Italian at all. And uh, um, so, and, and the, the Italians generally speak Italian fairly, fairly well. But, you know, when you start getting into, yeah, I'm sorry, English, I'm sorry. They do not speak Italian. Yeah. Uh, they do speak English fairly well. 
Uh, but when you start talking business language, uh, taxes, uh, you know, a variety of other issues, it becomes a little bit more problematic. And so the intern was able to bridge that and was very helpful. So Choose New Jersey is planning on doing that again in this winter semester and is looking for an intern uh, that will again accompany them and help them in their various uh, travels. Uh, they just got back uh, this uh, in October, they went to uh, Germany and to Israel. Uh, and they're planning again to go back to Italy uh, in, uh, in the spring, I believe. So there are a lot of opportunities there. Uh, you know, Chief New Jersey, uh, in many respects, can only do so much, but uh, they certainly believe in the connection between business, university, and education, and uh, uh, the, uh, the opportunities that the state can provide to help uh, stimulate that. And, uh, um, and that's one of the reasons why the program that's offered by Montclair State is so interesting to them. And obviously, with their contacts and their members, they try to stimulate that interest as well, trying to attract, uh, uh, and get these uh, contributors, so to speak, to also work with the uh, intern program and try to get them involved. So as for me, uh, I did not go through the Montclair State program. I'm a little too old for that. Um, but I did, uh, um, I did have the opportunity when I was a child, when I was 10 years old, to live in Italy. And I fell in love with Italy. I was 10 years old, and um, as a result, and my parents, you know, you were talking full immersion. There was no choice. I went to an Italian school, school coming from New Haven, learning only English, and I had no abilities in Italian whatsoever, thrown into the wolves. I was very fortunate. I had a, a school teacher. He was a delightful man. And uh, what he did was is he put me with the smartest kid in the class and basically told that young man that if I failed, he failed. So um, we, were, we were swimming together. and. Uh, I, he became a friend, and uh, you know we, we uh, learned quite a bit together. But all this to say that I was able to, you know, because of, of my appreciation for the country, for the culture, and the like, I, I pursued that. And uh, uh, I also uh, lived in Italy from uh, when I was 19 to 21, uh, spending a full two years there, and then I studied. Uh, I was an Italian major in college, and so with that, uh, I gained appreciation for not just Italy, but the culture and like. And these last few years, I've had the opportunity to be able to use that in connection with my business. And I have a number of Italian clients. I go over there, they come over here. Uh, and uh, so I spend a good part of my day going back and forth between English, Italian, and French, depending on uh, what the situation calls for. Uh, but the point that I'm trying to make is that there is a truly a practical application to languages. And it's not just about the Caccio and the Catac and, and, and those. Uh, although, you're, if you don't spend time with them, it's hard to understand the Italian mentality of today. And, and it, it's very interesting. One of the things that I've come away with these last several, uh, uh, last several years is that in order to understand the Italians, you have to understand their history. And it doesn't start with the 1500s or the 1200s or the 500s. It starts with Roman history. It goes that far back. The Etruscans and, and the creativity that the, the Italian people have today is really part of their DNA, and, and that's that developed over centuries. And so they have a real history. And so if you want to try to understand, you know, Italian business and, and why they they, uh, they do the things that they do or think the way that they think, it, if you spend time with the Italian literature of the 13th, 14th, 15th century, you know, you, you read Dante's Inferno and you see what he talks about in terms of his various friends that he placed in the various circles of, of hell. Uh, there's a reason why he did that, and there's some politics behind it, there, there's all sorts of machinations behind it, and it's well worth spending the time to, to do that. But you don't have to know that in order to learn the language today. You don't have to really spend time with it if you don't want to, but it certainly is worth spending the time. And it's, it's an enrichment, you know, from my own personal perspective, that uh, is lost if we strictly stick to business. But uh, uh, because I can also tell you that when you spend time with Italian clients, uh, and I can speak with the Italians, the Italians, but also can speak of my relationship with the French, uh, there's a real appreciation by the, the citizens of those countries if you have some kind of an inkling about their history, about their literature, about who they are and what they're about. And it, and it develops conversations that are enriching in and of themselves. So you benefit not just monetarily, but there's an enrichment that comes from the human and personal relationships, and, and it's, it's worth considering in, in this process. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I, 
and you, your contribution would touch uh, on all the points uh, and uh, in, a, in a beautiful way because it's a lived experience. Uh, and uh, uh, Eric is now a lawyer, works in, that, uh, in business uh, and, then, and still cherishes uh, that experience uh, and how language plays a part in it. He also always tells a story that I think it's uh, worth mentioning, perhaps as an anecdote, that um, um, the, the difference between doing uh, business in general but doing it with Italian uh, is that they're the only ones uh, who basically, when you say that you need something very specific, uh, they're, they're just going to try to adapt. Um, you know, they don't go by the rules necessarily, <laughs> but that means uh, that they end up uh, in uh, responding uh, to new needs, uh, to new people uh, in a certain creative way, which has to do with the fact that rules have not been part of history necessarily, or rules have changed too often, or there may have been resistance because they were coming from foreign conquerors, right? And the ability to invent something for themselves and for the people who were around them became actually uh, very resourceful, uh, absolutely vital. Um, so uh, is there any uh, other comment? I don't want to keep you here too long because I know that it's going to be quite of an adventure to go back home tonight. Yes, Yvette. Um, does Choose New Jersey focus mainly on European countries? Europe? No, we, we have, uh, we have uh, missions that go not just to European countries, but also to India and uh, Israel and uh, the Mediterranean Basin as well. In large part, it's, it's based on what the opportunities are and the interest that's been expressed by uh, those countries. So every year there is, um, uh, President Obama established this, Select USA, which is essentially a trade show for all of the states in the country to come in, buy a booth, and basically sell their state. And uh, all of the uh, embassies and delegations around the world are invited to come in and participate in that. And so during that event, uh, you have these trade groups or missions that come and, and knock on the doors of the various states. So depending on the kind of interest that's expressed by uh, the various countries, uh, there, is, uh, um, there are delegations sent. So India is, is one of them. But you also have to consider, and this is one of the things about Choose New Jersey and, and part of their pitch, you have to consider where New Jersey is. In essence, New Jersey is the doormat to the rest of the country. We have the, the largest port on the East Coast, we have uh, a network of roads and railroads, even though the railroads have their own problems, but we have a, a network of, of transportation that's based just outside of Newark that within two hours you can reach about a third of the population of the country. And so when you consider you have that ability, it, meet, it becomes very attractive. And then if you add to that, that everybody wants to be in New York, everybody wants that New York address, but when they start realizing the cost, I just had a client who came and they were looking at uh, office space in New York, it's 75, 80, 90 dollars a square foot. They got space in New Jersey for 35 dollars a square foot. The cost of labor in New Jersey, yeah, the taxes may be on the par with New York, but in the end, uh, the cost of labor is lower because the cost of living in New Jersey, you will never believe it, but it is lower than in New York City. So, you know, you have those things that compete with uh, the other states around, and the access to the port, the transportation network makes it a very attractive state. So, when you consider also what it, where it's what it's uh, facing, and that's the Atlantic, then your natural training partners are going to be on the other side of the Atlantic, as opposed to a place like California, Washington, uh, and Oregon, where you're looking at the Pacific, and you will, your natural training partners are going to be from that part of the world. Then uh, thanks uh, to all of you for being here, to our uh, gracious uh, uh, guests, uh, the Dean uh, for staying for the entire program. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Eric Perkins, uh, uh, for his uh, long travel, heavy winter, and uh, uh, all of you, uh, an interesting mix of colleagues, uh, people from different offices, the Dean office uh, uh, and the foundation, as a matter of fact. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Good night.